Hello and welcome to World History. This is the second in a series of lectures that we will be dealing with world history from the prehistoric times to around 1600. And we're going to talk in a kind of an overview of the Stone Age. This is a period of time in which humans are using as their primary tools stone. They can use stone and bone and stone and something else, but basically stone is the tool of choice. And it's usually about this time that I show a video that I can't show here and now because YouTube has a very weird policy of uh, copyright. And I don't want this channel taken down, so I'm not going to be using any videos. I'm I'll point you towards where you can find some that would be relevant to what we're talking about, but I, I can't actually show them on these videos themselves, where normally I would show them in class. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to do that on these videos. So again, you're missing out on some of the stuff that we do in class through these online lectures. Not quite the same as it is in being in the class. There's no interplay, no exchange of questions between the instructor and the student, and, and all of that type of thing that uh, makes college college. But hey, we're in unusual times, and so unusual things happen. So anyway, the Stone Age, it lasts for millions of years, some three million plus years into the past. It only ends when humans begin to use metals as their primary tools, which means bronze. The Bronze Age begins about 3000 BC. Prior to that, they had been using some metals before, like gold and copper, but those are very soft metals. They're not used for tools. They're used for generally decoration. Copper being too soft. Copper axes are nowhere near as good as a good stone axe. A good stone axe will cut down a tree. A good stone blade will flay through flesh very quickly and easily, and they're not terribly difficult to create. And it isn't until you get to bronze, where you have bronze being an amalgam of metals. Copper and tin, or copper and arsenic, combining together to make copper a stronger metal, so that it can hold an edge, so that it can compete and surpass that of the stone axe, and the stone knife, for the most part. But in that period of time, we have the Stone Age. The Stone Age is not the Flintstone version of the Stone Age. It's not the modern family. It, they don't have television sets and movie theaters and drive-ins and uh, foot-powered cars and all of that. But our image of this period has undergone a number of changes over time. Uh, in the past, we used to think of the Stone Age as a period of brutal savagery in which humans faced with the necessities of existence and the shortage of resources and the dangers that existed out in the world. Animals are stronger, they have better uh, claws and teeth, and humans generally aren't going to do so well against them. And that means that humans, in order to survive, we believed, would have to do extraordinary things to survive. So that if Grandma got too old, she couldn't help out anymore. Well, too bad, Grandma. You're done. Push you over the cliff. Put you into a stew. Whatever. That isn't quite the case. And we know that isn't quite the case because we have archaeological evidence that shows that that's not the case. We have, for example, uh, the skeletal remains of individuals who were old for their time, 40, 
individuals who, and they didn't live much beyond that at that time, and that is for a variety of reasons, uh, lack of a proper diet, uh, scarcity of food sometimes, uh, the wearing down of teeth so that they can't uh, masticate their food as well, creating a number of digestive problems, not getting in as much nutrition that way, uh, poor nutrition, uh, the dangers of disease, the dangers of wild animals, all kinds of things conspire together to create, for the most part, a much lower life expectancy for people in the Stone Age. Um, and because of the harshness of the living conditions, people suffered a number of physical ailments as well, arthritis being very common because of the hard physical labor and often very repetitive types of labor. We see a number of people who have uh, very severe arthritis. And yet we see that these individuals lived beyond that period in which they were incapable of working any longer, even incapable of chewing their own food. So these are individuals who would have been cared for, we believe, by family members, maybe by extended family. So they cared for their old. They cared for their young as well, because we can see that again in the fossil record where we have the uh, remnants of individuals who were uh, deformed uh, from birth, who were incapable of going out on the hunt or even going out and gathering food. They weren't able to contribute to the tribal organization, to the family as well as the rest of the members of the family, if at all, and yet they were cared for. They grew up. They lived um, almost as long as any of the other members of the society. Again, this can only happen because they were cared for. They were loved. We also know that they were more sophisticated than we gave them credit for. We know this, for example, because we can see that they were performing brain surgeries. We know they were performing brain surgeries because we have found skeletal remains with holes in them. Now, at first, when these skeletons, these skulls were found with these holes in them. Most people, because they were still believing that the, the past was filled with brutality and savagery and dog-eat-dog -dog kind of a world, they saw these skulls and they thought, ah, this is uh, a, uh, an indication of someone who has been killed, either in battle or uh, because they weren't able to pull their weight, uh, they were executed and wiped out. And then they began to notice that the holes in these skulls had been smoothed, were smooth. And they began to think, well, okay, maybe these skulls are being used as drinking vessels then. This was an individual who had been an enemy and they had killed them, and then they smoothed it down using uh, sand or whatever it was so that they could then pour drinks into this person's skull and then drink from it, saying, ah, <laughs> this is what happens to my enemies. Don't become my enemy, or I'll be drinking from your skull next. So that was the image that people had of the past until in the 1860s, when a physician by the name of Paul Broca, and some of you may know or recognize the name Broca because there is an area in the brain known as Broca's area that is where language is interpreted within the brain, and it's named after him. Well, 
he had a, an archaeologist friend who gave him one of these skulls as a present. And as a physician, he looked at the skull differently than an archaeologist. And when he looked at these holes and he saw that they had been smoothed over, he saw that this was not an artificial smoothening. This wasn't something that had, you know, sandpaper scraping it down to smooth it. Instead, this was a natural process of healing. So these individuals had lived after these holes had been created in their skulls. And that means that because we were finding, and in some skulls there are multiple incision areas, multiple holes in their skulls, you can go on the internet and find lots of these skulls where uh, there are holes in them. And that means that this was being done on purpose using what were no, what are known as trepanning devices. And you, again, you can look up those on the internet and find these trepanning devices. They are basically... Um, saws, if you will, using uh, a kind of bow that will, when you pull your arm back and forth, it will create a scraping of this stone upon the skull, and it will wear away the skull, so that you can pop out that little area and expose the brain inside. And... So people began to realize that these are operations. These are things that people are doing on purpose. But for what reason? Well, that's still open for speculation. Some people truly believe that this is for medical purposes. They were opening them up to play with the brain inside. It may be that in the past, somebody who had suffered a stroke, had fallen and hit their head, cracked their head open, and they were able to function better again. And they said, ah, well, crack open the skull, play around with the brains inside, and voila, things are fixed. That could be the case. Or it could be that they were doing it for religious reasons, if or re scientific religious reasons. If you've ever had a migraine headache before, you know that it pounds and pounds your skull. And in the past, their civilizations are based not on science and the understanding of the universe based upon scientific principles and laws, but instead are based on supernatural um, things that happen. Things are caused not because of atoms colliding with other atoms, creating lightning. They are formed instead because of angry gods. So if you have a throbbing pain in your head, it's because in their way of looking at the universe that there is some spirit inside of you, some little demon that's trying to get out. So you open it up, allow them to get out, and voila, your headache pain is gone. Certainly that is also a possibility, but one that I think may also be inserted in there. And this is my own personal idea. I, I haven't seen anybody else espouse it. Eventually somebody will, and they'll claim it, and... I'll be out of any kind of fame for it, but my idea is that it is probably also, at least in some societies at some particular locations, a part of beautification. People thought that this made them look better for some reason. Maybe one hole in a particular area of their skull, maybe another and another and another, and it creates a pattern. It creates a, 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 a difference on their skull, on their face, on their head. 
And humans eh, have done some rather unusual things for beautification. We know that, for example, the, the Mayans used to drill teeth so that they could put sparkly little stones in there. We know that other civilizations will create things like rings on people's necks, not to necessarily stretch their necks out. That isn't exactly what's happening. But it looks as if it is, because it's these rings are pushing their shoulders down and down, and it makes their head seem as if their neck is being elongated. Lots of different examples that we have in human civilizations around the world where they do unusual things to their bodies for either beautification or for some ritual, mystical in nature. And so this should be inserted in there as a possible explanation for uh, people doing treepening. But this treepening shows that they were fairly sophisticated. They were able to do brain surgery and allow their patients to recover from it and probably having some kind of uh, anesthesia to keep them from feeling the pain. Probably alcohol, probably a good deal of alcohol. Alcohol has been uh, created, developed for a considerable period of time in human civilization. Not terribly difficult to create alcohol. You basically have water and you've got um, some kind of plant material in there that's uh, fermenting. And after a while, it uh, can alter it. It can create, through the fermentation process, an alcohol. Now, of course, a number of people probably died along the way, got sick along the way in its development. But hey, eventually people, ta-da, discover alcohol. And... Civilization changes as a result. Now, many of the things that are used on humans, many of the medical practices like setting legs and things of this nature, are derived from what they do to animals. They do it with the animal first before they do it with the human. An animal break its breaks its leg, well, you pop it back in place, you wrap it around, and eventually it heals. Well, you can do that with the human as well. And we can see that they perform operations on animals. And later, they'll do operations on humans as well. We know they were fairly sophisticated as well from the way that they will move around in the world. Now, the current theory is that humans all come out of Africa that in a series of waves, humans have been, for whatever reason, pushed out of Africa. Current theory is that this is caused because of uh, droughts that periodically take place in Africa, reducing the amount of available food sources there. Humans, not wanting to starve, leave, go elsewhere. And uh, most of that travel is done, of course, on foot. People walk. They go and walk until they're far enough away that there are now new available resources. They settle down. They use up those resources. They move to another location. Now, other than walking, we have indications that people have been using other modes of transportation for quite some time. We have, for example, in certain caves, uh, usually in uh, Spain or in France, for example, that depict a variety of different scenes, and one of which was of a horse that appeared to have something flowing out of its mouth. Some speculated that these were reins. Reins are used to move a horse in one direction or another. And that is certainly possible. Though others have discounted it, saying, no, they aren't reins. It's just that this horse has been running for so long that it's got spittle coming out of its mouth. Eh, what's the truth? I don't know. I don't think anybody knows. 
news, the truth. But these are ideas that have been pushed around. And this was a painting from some 15,000 years ago. Interestingly, though, from the fossil record, we have uh, horses having reins in their mouth from only about 6,000 years ago, from about 4,000 BC in the Mesopotamian area. And we know this because from the fossil record, the wear patterns on the teeth of certain animals is such that we can see that something was uh, jostling the teeth to the point where it was wearing them down, creating a striation, grooves in their teeth, which is indicative of the bit that you put in the mouth where the reins are attached. So, oh, and uh, before I move on, I should probably talk a little bit about uh, these terms I've been banding about BC and AD, and I believe your textbook has another set of terms that they use, BCE and uh, CE. What do all of these mean? Well, these are calendar definitions. BC stands essentially for uh, before Christ. It's a uh, Christian-based calendar system. BC, before Christ. And AD is from a Latin phrase, Anno Domini, which is in the year of our Lord. And these were designated in the Middle Ages by some uh, monk somewhere who decided that counting back through time, that all the way back uh, when Christ was born, that's the year one. And before that, you count down to when Christ is going to be born. So the year before one is two. The year before two is three. So the further back in time we go, the bigger the numbers get. After his birth, after the year one, then the numbers become one and two and three and four AD. Before his birth, one and two and three and four BC, before Christ. Larger the number, the further back in time. All right. Uh, the other uh, terms are that of your textbook, which is a BCE. And that stand, that's being used by individuals who don't want to uh, alienate anyone based upon their religious standing. And so while it is that they use the same dates, that nomenclature, rather than saying B.C. or A.D., they say B.C.E. and C.E. C.E. correlates to A.D., Anno Domini. C.E. stands for Common Era. It's the exact same dating as A.D., though. B.C.E. is the exact same dating as B.C., but again, it's a uh, nomenclature that is non-religious in standing, so instead of before Christ, it is before the Common Era. So they are the exact same datings, just the nomenclature is different. All right, so the wheel. If you read cartoons, comic strips, things of that nature, uh, the wheel is the first thing that people invent in the Stone Age. And that's not true. True, children's toys had wheeled vehicles before actual wheeled vehicles were used. But wheeled vehicles are a relatively late development in civilizations. And there are a number of reasons for that. Wheeled vehicles need a smooth surface. So you've got to clear 
rocks out of the way. You've got to fill in dents. You've got to compact soil so that it can stand up to the heavy load of the wheeled wagons, that type of thing. That takes time, energy, effort. It takes organization. It takes a civilization that is more highly bureaucratized, if you will, a higher level of civilization. It's easier to carry things on the backs of humans or the backs of animals than it is to put them, to build a wagon to carry them in. Now, once you've got the wagon, though, once you've got the road, you can have the wagon carry these heavier loads, easier, faster, all of that type of thing. But the roads have to be in there. And that takes a larger civilization to be able to do. So that doesn't come about until later. Probably one of the earliest modes of transportation, other than walking or running, is that of the boat. Now, it may not be exactly your definition of what a boat is. It could just be a couple of logs tied together. It could be a hollowed out log. It could be uh, animal skins uh, stitched together in uh, on the outside of a uh, wooden framework. It could be all kinds of different types of things. But boats we know from, not that we've found boats from 40,000 years ago or more, but we do know that boats must have been used that long ago because that's about the period of time that the Aborigines in Australia begin to arrive. And the only way they're going to be able to get there is by boat. They can't walk on water, they can't fly, they can't teleport, they can't swim that far. Swimming across the English Channel, which is only 20 miles or so of a distance, is an extreme challenge today. You cannot find men, women, and children who are swimming hundreds of miles to make it to Australia. And even though in the past there have been ice ages where the ocean levels have lowered, exposing more land, ex creating things like land bridges that have allowed uh, people to travel from Asia into the Americas, the river, the rivers, the oceans have not, never lowered down far enough where people could walk to Australia. So the only way they're going to be able to get there is by some type of boat. Now, the first, uh, another anecdotal evidence showing an early development of boats comes from the Aegean area, basically the area to the right of the Mediterranean, around where Turkey and Greece are located. Here, we have in uh, cities found volcanic glass that have been used to make knives and other types of things, tools. And we know that this volcanic glass came from islands in the Aegean Sea, islands that are too far for individuals to have swam to. Certainly, they wouldn't have been able to do so carrying uh, heavy rocks with them. So, and we know that they can, this volcanic glass came from these particular items because each and every volcano is very specific. It has a very specific chemical composition that pushes out very specific chemical composition volcanic material. So we can trace to exactly where this volcanic material, which volcano it came from. And these volcanoes are simply too far out for people to swim to. So they must have used some type of flotation device, some type of boat to be able to do this. The first 
real archaeological evidence of a boat being used was a paddle, wooden paddle, found in the British Isles that was dated to about 8500 BC or about uh, 10,500 years ago. We also have evidence showing that boats were being used along the western shores of Europe and into the British Isles because of the development of megalithic structures. And again, here is where I would show a number of videos on megalithic structures uh, like Stonehenge, like the uh, Barrows, the uh, large burial places made from very large stones that are all along the western coast of Europe from Spain and Portugal up through uh, France and the Netherlands and up to Denmark and throughout the British Isles. And that can happen really only Bec and they're all along the coastal area, meaning that very likely people are traveling along the waterway with boats from one location to another. Very similar structures uh, to some in the past, it has pointed to perhaps there being some kind of ancient civilization. This is where you get the idea of people from like Edgar Rice Burroughs and, and others who depicted uh, Conan the Barbarian and the um, Atlantean civilizations and all of that type of thing because of these megalithic structures that come about all about the same time all along the uh, western coast of Europe uh, that type of thing. Uh, social life. We know that men were shaving their beards for at least the last 30,000 years. We know that because they were creating razors that were being used, uh, creating razors. Again, this is where I would have shown you a video of an individual who uh, can show how flaking was done to create uh, sharpened edges from rocks to create a variety of types of tool sets. You can find them on YouTube. Uh, there are some pretty good ones out there. They're fun to watch, fun to see how you can make stone tools. Uh, really good stone tools, though, take a good deal of effort. It's not, you know, something that's just that easy. But in either case, uh, razors we know are being used for uh, shaving beards off, uh, cutting hair, things of that nature. We know that people are beginning to wear uh, more closely fitted clothes, not just draping animal skins around them because we found needles that have been dated from about 20,000 years ago. Needles are used to sew, stitch together animal skins and later uh, woven fibers, cloth together to create clothes. Linen clothing uh, first being discovered some 80 or developed some 8,500 years ago. Hunting. We know that tools are being used to assist people in hunting. We know that spears have been around for in, in one form or another for thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years. But other types of tools that can be used, like boomerangs, for example. They're not just for fun. Throw them and they come back to you. Boomerangs have been around for quite some time. And again, here is where I would have shown a video on hunting using a boomerang. There are a number of um, 
tribal organizations in the world still in existence today that use them to hunt with. Uh, the earliest known boomerang, however, comes from Poland from some 21,000 years ago. Arrowheads. Uh, the earliest ones that we've been able to find have been dated from as far back as some 18,000 years ago. And those come from Spain. Arrows are a difficult product to manufacture. You have to be able to find the um, right kind of wood, make sure it's straight enough, whittle it down, carve it down until it's nice and straight, and then you need to chip away at stone to create the arrowhead itself, and then you've got to have some kind of adhesive to be able to, and string, to be able to wind all of that around and glue that arrowhead to the shaft of the arrow. And then you've also got to glue the fletching, the uh, pieces of uh, bird feathers, to the end of it. So it's a very sophisticated, very difficult device to make. And that's been with us for some 20,000 years or so. And of course, fishing. The earliest fishing hooks that we've been able to date come from Italy from some 16,000 or 14,000 years ago. Food-wise, we know that uh, one of the earliest foods to be domesticated, to be able to take from the wild and grow in fields where you want them to grow, come from probably 15,000 years ago or so. Now, the current theory of where these grains came from, why it was that we transformed from just gathering them out in the wild and planting them, agriculture, is that somewhere in the wild, two varieties of wheat hybridized together that created bigger seeds that were no longer blown away by the winds to fall far away from the parent plant. Instead, they were so big that they just fell right next to the parent plant and grew up from there. And people got the idea, oh, okay, seeds make the plants. Plant seeds where I want them. You got agriculture. My idea is a little bit different. This may or may not be the case, but I think dogs helped us develop civilization. I think one day someone was out playing fetch with a dog, and dogs are the earliest domesticated creature that we have, earlier by some indications than agriculture, by a long period of time. By some indications, uh, dogs have been domesticated from 100,000 years ago. So long before we had agriculture. So my thinking is that somebody was going out playing fetch with their dog. And they threw this stick way out there into the wild grass area where people went and gathered grains. And the dog went out to try to find the stick, but they weren't able to locate the stick. So instead, the smaller brain of the dog said, well, this looks like a stick. I'll bring this to the master. Yeah, they'll never know the difference. I don't know the difference. Brought it back. But the bigger-brained human said, oh, that's not the stick. You are a bad dog. That is a grain. That is a sheaf of grain. That is bad. Well, it's good because I, you know, grind it into, you know, stuff and cook it up and eat it. And, you know, that's good. But bad. That's not the stick. So the dog, of course, being a dog, will take this sheaf of grain, dig a hole, toss it into the hole, bury it, hike their leg up and water it, and then walk back to the master. Ah, I got rid of the bad stick. Now let's go play. Sometime later, the human comes back, notices that where dog had buried this grain and watered it is now growing the grain. So, the idea of agriculture is born. Take the seeds, plant them where you want, water them, 
you've got agriculture. With agriculture, you've got civilization. With civilization, you can begin to have dog parties to thank dogs for creating civilization. Thank you, dogs. That's wonderful. We know it wasn't cats, because cats are a much more recent domesticated animal than dogs. Cats are domesticated only after civilization has really begun. So, uh, what else is there? We also have some idea of the ancient past religion. We have, for example, statues of very large women. Large breasts, large buttocks, large stomachs, maybe heavily pregnant. Some people believe that this was the first deity to be worshipped that this was a kind of female fertility goddess, that you would worship this goddess of fertility and your crops in the field would become more fertile. Your wife would be more fertile, giving birth to more children. More children means more farm hands that you don't have to pay, working out in the field to create more food. When you get old, they can take care of you. So this is a goddess to be worshipped. But that isn't what I think. It may be that that's what it is, but I have a different view. My view is that this is the ancient world's first pornography. They don't have Playboy. They don't have the porn channel. So they make these statues. Not being worshipped, they're being something else. That's my idea. But there are books out there, uh, one entitled When God Was a Woman, that you can read, and uh, the theory is that the first god deity to be worshipped is a goddess, a woman, a personification of fertility. That eh, may be true, or maybe these statues, and you can find images of these statues in your textbook, I believe there's a picture of it, and others on the internet that you can find. And my idea isn't goddess, it's porn. Eh, you don't have to believe me. Think what you want. You're in college. You're of an age that you can think for yourself. Alrighty, folks. With that, we'll end the overview of the Stone Age, and we'll move on to other exciting topics next time. Thank you.